Thank you, Bridget. And uh, one can always rely on Simon to get us fired up for um, what I envisage to be an exciting uh, conference. Uh, we're going to go straight into panel one, which is the first panel of two uh, discussing Europe's evolving issue space. And I added the word evolving here in light of Simon's introduction. Um, I will uh, be introducing very briefly the papers one by one, but I think the best thing is to simply go ahead in the presentations. And as Lorenzo was reminding us, it'd be really sweet and very much appreciated if you can keep your presentation to 10 minutes, since this is a, a busy panel. So I, I, I can't wave time is up notes, that doesn't really work. I don't think waving really works because you may not see me. So what I'm gonna do, if you don't mind, is to simply say time, just one word, when you are at 10 minutes, so you know where you stand. But um, now, without further ado, Davide Angelucci and Lorenzo De Sio, um, both from the Lewis University of Rome, and I see Lorenzo is starting screen sharing, which is great. This is the one paper for those of you who had the, conf the conference program where the title has changed. And I don't need to read it to you because you see it on the, on the slide here. So Davide and Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Um, you may be muted. Yes, I think I am not now. Great. So thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, let me start, of course, by apologizing for the title change. But as you will realize, this paper is a work in progress. This is the first conference where we are presenting this. And it reflects how our agenda is going up the ladder of generality. So we started from territorial divides and we moved to economic marginality, which is a much broader category. Let me go straight to the point of our idea of a great misunderstanding that we suggest. Our starting point is basically that if we look at electoral change broadly meant in this age of populist and cultural demarcation parties, we started from a point of view that is very common among commentators, even more perhaps than among scholars. That is to say, most commentators tend to take for granted that now electoral change mostly takes as drivers cultural conflicts and cultural issues. And these comments usually borrow from several frameworks that we know very well. I see Hans Peter here in my screen view, and also Simon Hicks has, has given an excellent example of these theoretical frameworks about this. Now, but what was indeed clear, even from Simon's presentation, is that most of these interpretations, especially among commentators, usually rely on party or party family based evidence. That is to say, you read that frequently among comments. That is to say, if cultural demarcation parties are the winners, it means that the driving issue should be cultural issues. Now, this, which is technically a cross level inference, is not so obvious. And what we see in the literature is that there is much less frequent testing of the actual issue relevance at the individual level. And usually those that do, including some recent work by Hans Peter, show that the picture is a bit more nuanced. That is to say, often economic issues are even relevant for populist or, or cultural demarcation parties. And also what we haven't found so far in the literature is a focus not only on vote choice at the individual level, but more specifically on vote change, that is to say shifting from one party to another. And our, our hunch, our basic intuition is that there could be a paradox taking place. That is to say that the success of these parties might indeed come from economic issues. First of all, because uh, there is empirical evidence, this is for example from our ICCP project, the issue competition comparative project, which shows that in actual campaigns, these parties indeed mention economic issues. So our questions are basically, first, whether do in fact economic issues also matter for the success of these parties? And even on cultural issues, there could be a chance that these importers in fact might come from economic determinants. This is for simple reasons, is a reason of interaction between supply and demand we know that because of international constraints and market integration, it's very hard for parties to provide 
an economically protectionist left-wing policy supply, but there might be demand for these policies. So one solution might be that indeed, given that there is only supply for cultural demarcation, usually coupled with anti-establishment attitudes, this could be a supply that indeed attracts people even in terms of their economic discontent. In both these cases, we would observe the paradox in which economic determinants are behind the success of these cultural demarcation parties. Of course, a key test for point two would be that even the relevance of cultural issues might be conditional on economic status. And this leads to our empirical expectations. The first expectation is that we are, we are dealing with data about uh, national elections in 2017 and 2018. Our expectation is that economic issues should keep a relevant role for structuring vote change, even where cultural demarcation parties are successful. Second point, even when cultural issues are relevant, we expect that they might be more relevant among individuals in worse economic conditions or in regions that experienced economic problems. So in terms of data and methods, uh, we are relying on survey data from the ICCP six countries. And uh, these data sets are characterized by a very large number of issues, 30 issues in each country with country specific framings and wordings. Our key dependent variable is vote shift towards the party, either joining the party or leaving the party or remaining neutral. And our focal predictors are issue goal credibility items, which is a novelty we introduced for this project. And basically, we're doing so in a stacked data matrix. This is an example of the data matrix that you can find in the article where vote change is either plus one joining the party or minus one leaving the party. And basically, we have issue credibility items for a number of positional and valence issues. So first of all, we determine the key issue drivers of electoral change in each specific election. And then we interact this with individual level and regional level economic status. I leave the floor immediately to David for the findings about this. Okay, so now moving to the empirical results of our analysis, we first estimated the effects of issue credibilities on electoral change in our six countries. Uh, and what we, what we found, and this is basically the broad picture that I want to, uh, to give you, um, uh, is that out of 27 issues, significant issues across the six countries that we found to be relevant predictors of electoral change, uh, 14 can be basically uh, referred to the so-called demarcation integration dimension. So basically issues such as immigration or um, the European Union integration. And this is particularly relevant in countries such as Austria and Germany. Uh, as you can see uh, in blue, we, uh, we highlighted cultural issues and in uh, yellow economic issues. Uh, but with the exception of these two countries where we have a prevalence of cultural issues, actual economic issues emerged quite relevantly in all the other countries, or uh, we have basically a situation that is a bit more balanced between economic and cultural issues. This is the case of Italy, for example, uh, but this is also the case of the Netherlands and the UK. Uh, while in France, we have the predominance of economic issues over cultural issues in predicting vote, uh, vote change in the election. So uh, these first preliminary results tell us that, yes, indeed, the cultural issues were relevant, but besides cultural issues, we have a strong effect of economic issues as well, uh, which basically refers to uh, economic growth, uh, fight unemployment, or economic redistribution, so classical issues uh, on the left right dimension. Um, and uh, in some countries, actually, these issues were more relevant compared to cultural issues. Our next step uh, is to uh, now interact these issue credibilities that were significant in predicting vote change with individual economic conditions. Uh, the idea is that basically, and our expectation is that even when cultural issues are relevant, this uh, relevance might be due actually to uh, deeper economic, individual economic conditions. Uh, and now the results that we have are a bit more mixed here. Uh, again, the most problematic cases for, for our uh, expectations are Austria and Germany in a sense, 
uh, in Austria, we can see that we have an economic issue that uh, is significant, but only among uh, better off people, which is provide social justice, while immigration, contrary to our expectation, actually uh, is significant in predicting electoral change only among richer families. Uh, the only cultural issues are going in the right direction in the sense of our expectation is the direct democracy issue. Even more complex is the case of Germany, where we have, for example, um, a series of issues referred to immigration, limit refugees, immigration rules, and refugee quotas. And here we see mixed evidence. Two out of these three issues are significant among uh, richer people, but there is one that is in the right direction, um, but our expectation that is the refugee quotas. Uh, but with the exception of these two countries, actually in the other countries, especially in Italy, the Netherlands and the UK, the results seem to be much more coherent with our expectations. And here we can see that both cultural issues and also economic issues tend to be much more relevant for um, uh, lower social strata, so to say. Uh, then what we did was to look at the, the, at the interaction of these issues with uh, aggregate level indicators of the economic status. So basically we included in our analysis the uh, per capita GDP at the provincial level. Uh, and here again, exceptions are Austria and Germany where our findings uh, are a bit more in contradiction with our results, but for the, all the other countries, these are in line with our expectation. Final step, two-way interactions between the contextual economic condition, individual economic conditions, and uh, issue credibilities. And in France, of course, the picture was already quite clear, but in Germany, this analysis actually resulted in a much more, um, uh, so to say, clear um, definition of, um, uh, of the picture. Indeed, we can see that also the issues that were in contradiction with our expectations actually are significant most of the cases, or in situations, in regions, poor regions, or among poor families, basically. So in situations and in conditions of economic disadvantage. This uh, led us to the conclusions. Uh, basically, economic issues were relevant, of course, to um, um, in affecting electoral change in our six countries. And also, for cultural issues, we find some evidence showing that, indeed, when these were relevant, also controlling four important uh, factors such as the interaction of these issues with education. So to take under control also the uh, cultural capital of our respondents, we found that basically these issues were significant, especially in lower social strata or disadvantaged areas. And this is basically the uh, question mark, uh, the origin of this, of this presentation, a great misunderstanding. This is basically uh, what we have tried to answer with this, or we are starting to try to answer with this presentation. There might be behind the success of the marcation integration parties, actually economic issues rather than cultural ones. Thank, Thank you, Davide and Lorenzo. Um, and let's go on to the second paper, which is by Nicola Magini from the University of Milan. New challenges for representative democracy the changing issue space in Western Europe. Nicola. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So uh, my paper is about the changing uh, issue space in Western Europe. You're looking at the this demand side of uh, politics. And um, as you know, uh, according to the literature, for a long time, the uh, part, party competition in Western Europe has been characterized by a unid unidimensional pattern along a broad left-right dimension. And although there was a multidimensional citizen attitude space, uh, both issue preferences of uh, citizens and party positions be synthesized according to a broad left-right distinction separating uh, uh, conservative from progressive stances on both economic and cultural issues. 
Uh, however, uh, over time, uh, scholars have stressed the increasing importance of the bi-dimensional structure of the political space using different labels, for instance, libertarian authoritarian divide, Galtan, or transnational cleavage, or integration uh, demarcation dimension, with the latter two highlighting the increasing importance of new issues related to new conflicts uh, linked with globalization, immigration, and EU integration. And other scholars, however, as have stressed the, the, the emerging uh, a, a third dimension along the, the other two. So they propose a three-dimensional model, for instance, Kitcher. Uh, and in these regards, it's important uh, to take into account also differences between generations with the several researches showing how uh, different ger the generation interpret the political space in different ways. Uh, so in my paper, I wanted to investigate this dimensionality of the political space uh, among citizens and looking at differences between different uh, uh, generations, particularly young people and older people. And relying on previous research and insight, I developed some hypotheses. Uh, I, for instance, the first one, I expect that in an issue space characterized by three main policy domains, uh, party constituencies' opinions on policy issues do no, lot, no longer fit a traditional broad left-right ideological alignment. And at the same time, I expect that this ideological inconsistency should be higher for voters for radical right, anti-establishment, and new parties. And finally, I expect that compared to older people's views, young people's issue preferences should be less concerned about economic issues and less ideologically consistent. Uh, as regards data, I use the same data of uh, Lorenzo and, uh, and Davide from the Issue Competition Compatible Project. So uh, survey data from seven Western European countries, which covered the several campaign issues that could be related to three basic uh, dimensions in the integration demarcation one dimension, the cultural Galtan and the economic left-right. And then I analyzed the, 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 the data, first looking at the average positions and standard deviations of main parties' constituencies, along with the salience of issue preferences. And then I applied the Mocken scale analysis in uh, both a deductive and induct, quasi-inductive way. Uh, as regards results, here I show uh, some results for the, for, for instance, from the, the Italian case. Uh, this graph shows the issue preferences and salience for major party constituencies in Italy, uh, with the comparison between older and young people, looking at the predefined dimension. And in the, the, the size of the marker is proportional to the salience. So the higher the marker, the higher the salience attached to these uh, issues. And uh, the graph shows the policy issues divided into rival goals. And as you can see in, in Italy, most party constituencies share a leftist opinion on most policy goals. Even uh, voters for the radical uh, right parties, for instance, looking at the, 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 the league, uh, on the issues related to flat tax, that was one of the signature proposal of the league in the electoral campaign, only a tiny majority of uh, voters league support this measure. And this inconsistency is even higher if we look at the uh, young people sample. And as regards, the same applies for cultural Galtan issues, even though uh, these issues are less salient for voters of the center-right parties in, in Italy, and with the exception of issues related to law and order. And uh, finally, as regards new issues related to EU globalization and migration, there is more 
there is more polarization, I would say, and dispersion with a clear distinction between uh, on a EU issue, uh, the voters for PD that are strongly pro EU and voters pro the League that are anti EU. But on immigration issues, there is a prevalence, a prevalence of conservative positions, even for PD voters, except when we deal with uh, rights of immigrants and their children. And uh, the, this, the same uh, results uh, are also in other countries. So confirming my expectation that most party constituencies are quite ideologically inconsistent, especially especially on the center right. And uh, this is true, especially as regards voters for the radical right that are consistent as regards their positions towards uh, issues related to the integration demarcation dimension, but they are quite leftist on economic issues and also on Galtan issues, especially the uh, youngster that are quite libertarian on moral issues related to gay, ma gay marriages and euthanasia and so on and so on. And also inconsistent from this point of view are also voters of anti-establishment parties like Five Star Movement in Italy or new parties like a march in France. Uh, finally, as I expected, there is a greater inconsistency of young voters, but uh, uh, especially as regards the salience of their pre issue preferences, because they are more concerned about cultural issues than economic ones. And finally, I show here the results of the scaling analysis. Here are the outputs uh, when applied to the predefined scales. So according to the, the age coefficients, when uh, the coefficient, age coefficient is equal to or greater than three, it means that the responses are quite consistent and so they can form a dimension. And, and here it's clear that uh, uh, while responses to issues that could be related to the integration demarcation dimension are quite consistent, forming a satisfactory scales, the other two dimensions are not real dimensions because uh, responses are not so consistent. And this is true, especially among the youngsters. And when I apply the um, Mocken scaling analysis in a quasi inductive way, so without predefined scales, so without constraints, I more or less uh, find the same results. So the, the hypothesized three dimensional model doesn't work except uh, in the British case, when I analyze older people policy pre preferences. And uh, in most cases, I found uh, a one dimensional structure, but this one dimensional structure is, is not related to economic traditional left right issues, but new issues related to the so-called new transnational cleavage or integration demarcation dim dimensions. Uh, and in, within these issues, uh, immigration issues are very important. Uh, and in some cases, uh, to, on two these issues, on two these dimensions, sorry, we can group also other Galtan items. But this is true, especially for older peoples, not for younger peoples, that are quite inconsistent on, on these issues because sometimes they are pro-gay marriage, but they are the, against immigrants, for example. And uh, again, issue preferences of young people are less consistent than those of older people, but uh, differences are not so huge, I would say. And uh, to conclude, these studies somehow uh, show that uh, issue preferences of citizens are quite ideologically inconsistent, but this doesn't mean that there is a destructuration of the political space because a sort of dimensionality still exists, but it regards issues related to the new uh, dimension, focusing the salience of issues related to EU immigration and globalization. And uh, this is true both for younger people and older ones. And this is in 
um, somehow reassuring for the predictability of uh, political behavior of young people and so for the stability of our political system. And finally, I would add that this doesn't mean that the left and right labels are not any more useful in heuristic stance. No, maybe people, uh, uh, we don't know if people interpret this new dimension in left and right terms or, or under new or under these uh, labels. But for sure they are, uh, they, they show on these policy issues inconsistency when we deal with uh, uh, economic issues and also moral issues. And um, of course, these are policy issues and not values. As regards values, this, the story maybe would be completely different. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Nicola. So let's go to the third paper, which is by Dimitri Toshkov from Leiden and uh, my good old colleague from the VU, Andre Krawel. Um, that is beyond the U curve, citizen and party preferences on European integration in multidimensional political space. I don't know who is presenting. I'm presenting, I'm trying to turn on the presentation. Okay. Can you see the presentation now? No, not yet. Oh. And right now. Oops, now I actually messed up my own screen. Can anyone see it? I still don't see anything. Okay, maybe we can go to the next one. I'll try to fix it because maybe it's something with my preferences. I'm sorry for that. That sounds good. <laughs> Um, so then um, let's move on to the paper by Federico Ferreira da Silva and Diego Garcia from University of Luzan, Andres Reljan and Lorenzo Cicchi from the EUI and Alex Drexel, the University of Luzern. I could have simply made this short and say from the EUI because you all have, continue to have strong links with the EUI. Um, comparing party positions in a European multidimensional political space cross-validation of the EU profiler EU and I longitudinal data set. All right. All right. Uh, let me see if I can share the screen if I don't have problems as well. Can you see it? There. Perfect. Great. So thank you very much. Um, this short paper can be essentially understood as a, as a methodological research note that compares um, estimates um, derived from three methods to, to, of party placement in a multidimensional European political space, expert service, uh, manifesto analysis, and voting advice applications. Voting advice applications are essentially independent platforms um, designed to inform and help citizens and voters find the best fit between their individual policy preferences and the uh, proposals put forward by the parties running for election. To do so when programming VAs, <clears throat> designers rely on a, on a multitude of, of sources and techniques to ascribe certain party positions to certain policy positions to political parties. For this reason, aside from uh, matching voters with, with, with parties, VAs end up partaking in the same type of uh, effort of party placement as expert service and manifesto analysis. But VAs have the particularity of reaching millions of users. They aim at informing citizens. They can potentially sway voting decisions. So there's an increased responsibility and uh, VA designers have put a considerable effort into perfecting a method to reliably estimate uh, and reliably measure party positions. But despite these efforts, we still know relatively little about how well VA is fair as a party placement method compared to standard sources of party positions such as expert service and manifestos. 
a few studies have uh, provided some snapshots of comparisons between VAAs and one method or the other, but we still lack a systematic cross-national longitudinal triangulation of VAA-based data with, with the other two methods of placing parties. And an important reason why, why we, we still lack this, this type of, of triangulation has a lot to do with the fact that unlike comparative data sources such as the Chapel Hill or the CMP, VAAs are usually designed for a single country or even for a single election in a given country. So sometimes they have very limited continuity in terms of time series and also the potential for comparisons across countries is, is quite limited. Uh, here at the UI, the Robert Schuman Center has been repeatedly running a VAA for the European Parliament elections. That includes all, all parties from all EU countries, uh, plus the UK. And um, starting with the first transnational VAA in 2009, the EU profiler, until the latest one, the EU and I 2019, the series of VAs now covers the broadest geographical uh, span of countries over the longest time series to date. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Um, but not at the UI. Uh, here, here we have pulled this data from, from the three time series into a cumulative data set, which we have called UP and I. And um, this data provides an ideal opportunity to, com to compare VAs as a method to estimate party positions. With, uh, with expert surveys and manifesto analysis. So very briefly, some details on the data set. Um, it contains 411 political parties, uh, 141 of which are um, continuously present across the three waves. And it covers a total of 42 policy statements. Now of these policy statements, only a few uh, are continuously uh, present across all three waves. And these are the ones that we have used to build these, these dimensions of analysis. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, they are not evenly distributed. Ideal, the left, ideally, the left-right dimension could have a few more statements, but it's still arguably able to cover the bulk of political competition on this socioeconomic left-right. So coming to the, to the cross-validation with, with CHES and CMP and the results, uh, we have basically compared the three data sources across the three dimensions that we've seen before. Um, this comparison was made based only on the 146 political parties that are uh, simultaneously present across the three, the three data sets. Um, and also because the original scales naturally varied uh, across data sets, we have uh, standardized the variables to facilitate comparability. So in the X axis, you are looking at standard deviation differences. What do we see from the results? Well, first of all, the UP and I estimates are um, largely, convert, largely converge with the ones from CMP and uh, even more so with the ones from Chapel Hill. Um, they do so across the three dimensions, although the estimates seem closer on the Galton dimension um, and slightly less close in the, in the socioeconomic left-right dimension, where sometimes the CMP estimates are in the opposite direction of the UP and I and Chapel Hill. Um, looking at the UP and I and Chapel Hill positions, they are remarkably close, especially on the conservative social democratic and Christian democratic party families, so the bigger ones. And finally, the median positions from the CMP um, also tend to converge slightly more to the center than the other two data sets. We have also run some, cor some correlations between, uh, between pairs of data sets and across time um, to get a better sense of how the estimations correspond and how they vary potentially across time. And basically the whole picture kind of corroborates what we have seen in a previous graph. So, a pretty strong correlation between the UP and I and uh, the Chapel Hill uh, that correlate at a very high level uh, in all three dimensions. Um, we see that across time, there has been a slight increase in the correlation. This is particularly visible in the middle column when we compare the UP and I with, with the CMP. There is a, quite a strong increase from the first edition in 2009 until 2019. 
overall, this, this triangulation analysis reveals a strong convergence between the estimates deriving from the, the three methods. And uh, it can be said that the UP and I party positions are largely comparable with the two other uh, data sources. And in a final section, we try to zoom in on factors that can potentially explain the mismatches in the estimates across the three data sets. And to do so, we have computed two dependent variables that take the absolute difference uh, in the estimations between, on the one hand, the UPNDI and Chapel Hill, and on the other hand, the UPNDI and CMP. And with that, we ran two OLS regressions with some factors that could possibly account for these differences. And when we look at the first model on the left, the comparison with, with chess, we see that two sets of factors are significantly related to the differences in the estimates. First, um, these differences seems driven by certain party families. The liberal, nationalist, and other party families are significantly more likely to diverge across the two data sets. This could be explained by the fact that they are more heterogeneous and that there are fewer observations for these body families. And secondly, the difference in estimates is significantly reduced uh, among parties participating in the European I self-placement procedure. And this speaks to, this is interesting because it says something about the added value of the iterative method employed um, in the UPNI um, compared to other VAAs. So basically this iterative method, we invite political parties to self-place uh, relative to the several policy statements that are to be, to be included in the VAA. Um, they give that information back to us. In the meantime, the country teams are coding the parties autonomously. And in a final calibration phase, we try to take into account both sets of information to provide a more accurate uh, party position. And it's interesting to note that uh, it, it apparently it, uh, it has a potential to reduce bias or at least to render uh, estimations that are more closely to the ones uh, from Chapel Hill. And in the second model, the comparison with CMP. In this case, the divergence in estimates is significantly greater for smaller parties for which Arguably, it's harder to retrieve information and infer party positions. Um, and aside from this, the only remaining significant difference concerns the Christian Democratic Party family. And this, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that this is the most underrepresented party family in CMP. Um, across, across the three waves, it only has 10 observations uh, that match with the UP and I parties. So, so this could lead to higher variance and. and uh, increase the divergence in the estimates. So just some concluding remarks. Besides being an important tool to match voters' preferences with, with, with the political supply, with political parties, our results show that VAAs are able to reliably estimate party positions. They correlate very highly with two of the most reputable data sources for, for party placement, and they correlate increasingly so across time. And uh, finally, this final exploratory analysis shows that there does not seem to be any systematic source of bias in the, in the remaining differences in estimates across the three methods. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, this, um, just um, may I just, Dimitar, shall we give it another shot? Yeah, let, let's try again. So. Yeah. I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, Martina, can you can you open the presentation for me, Dan? Yes. Okay. If we can just go on full screen for the presentation. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I'm going to let you know when I need the when I need the next slide. So apologies for this technical glitch. What I'm going to present today is work that I started two years ago, actually at the EUI, where I was a Jean Monet fellow. So I'm very excited to have an opportunity to share with you some results growing from, from this work. And I want to thank uh, Andre, who cannot be here, for providing me with all the data and discussing the ideas for this project. If we could go to the next slide. 
Um, I have a couple of words on the motivation for this project. And uh, I want to acknowledge that we know a lot about the nature of political space in Europe. A lot of it written by people who are in, uh, in this conference, so I don't, I don't need to go into the details. But what I want to emphasize is that a lot of what we know is based on studying political parties rather than citizens. And I see a big, a big difference in the political space that appears from studying political elites, including parties and uh, politicians, and the political space as it is perceived by citizens and voters. And uh, another shortcoming of this literature that I see is it, it assumes that we know what the underlying dimensions of the political space are and what their policy content is. And to some extent, this is inevitable because we have to come up with some structure to analyze it. At the same time, I think we can uh, be more open-minded about what the nature of the political space actually is and try to infer it from data alone. Um, but, but my bigger, biggest motivation is actually not so much an original theoretical contribution, but figuring out new ways to explore multidimensional political space. I think a lot of the discussions that we're having can be better understood if we just have better methods to visualize and to explore the nature of political space. So a lot of the motivation is about new visualization and exploration methods. Uh, next slide, please. With respect to European integration, what are my uh, concerns? What are my questions? First, um, as I see in the literature, a lot of the times, not always, but a lot of the times, it is assumed that EU positions load on this dimension that goes by so many different names, conservative, authoritarian, TAN versus liberal, progressive, cultural, uh, GAL dimension. And uh, as it was reminded uh, to us already today, the relationship between left, right, and uh, European integration preferences is supposed to represent an inverted U shape, high support at the center, which declines as one moves towards both extremes. And if we click on the next slide, then the question becomes what if EU positions are actually separate from the conservative progressive dimension? Now, I'm not the first one to ask that, but what I haven't seen so far is an exploration. If we admit, if we assume that there are these two dimensions, left, right, conservative, progressive, how does European integration positions, how do they actually map in this complex two-dimensional space? Next slide, please. My major premises are that we have three very different ways in which to study political and policy positions. The first one, click, is uh, self-placement. So this is basically citizens providing uh, statements where they stand on scales that have been previously defined by experts. So this relies on the assumption that both citizens and experts understand and know what these scales are, what they mean, and how they can position themselves. The next way to study policy position, however, is to assume that we know what the scales are, left, right, conservative, progressive, EU, but then the citizens don't. So we measure citizen positions from actually policy preferences, from the answers on concrete policy issues. And then we aggregate that ourselves into the previously defined scales. So in this sense, these positions are objective in quotation mark because they're not really objective, but it is the experts know the scales, citizens know their positions on issues. We aggregate the positions onto the scales. And then the third way to study positions is to basically assume that we don't know what the scales are, what the dimensions are, and the citizens don't know that neither. And uh, if we assume that, then the most proper way to analyze what citizens want is to conduct inductive factor analysis on the policy positions and see purely from the data what dimensions appear from the policy positions themselves. So the paper is based on all these three different assumptions or three different ways to look at citizen positions. I'm not gonna have the time to go into all that. I'm just gonna illustrate different results based on each of these three types of positions. To do that, next slide, please. I use data from voting advice applications and in particular from the Keys Compass from the Netherlands and its sister VAAs from Germany, Italy, and France. 
These were fielded in the, in the, just before the 2019 election for the European Parliament. The advantages, click, uh, VAA data is of course, that first of all, there is a lot of it. Uh, in the Dutch case, there is close to 100,000 responses. Even after we clean people who filled it outside the Netherlands, not in Dutch, filled it more than one time, took too little, took too much time, we still have almost 100,000 responses. So that's a lot, of, a lot of information, which is good because then we have good estimates for citizens who support small parties, which are normally not covered by surveys and also difficult to reach corners of the political space, meaning we have good coverage of all possible combinations of positions on the different scales. And the other advantage is we just have a lot of policy positions, and at the same time we have questions that ask citizens to self-place themselves on scale, so we can compare self-placement with actual policy positions. There are disadvantages as well, of course, click, and uh, one of those is of course, VAA data is not based on probability samples, but in the q and I can tell you more about that and how it's probably not a big problem. And more trivially, there are just differences in the, in the questions, the wording and the answer scales because these VAAs were not done by one single organization. So let's get to results. First, what I'm going to show you is how average positions on the anti-pro-EU scale and here scale means people just self-place themselves. And how this varies in terms of positions on the left-right scale and simultaneously on the conservative progressive scale. So what we see when we go on the next slide are actual landscapes. So on the left, you have the landscape that is in the Netherlands. And then on the right, you have the, of course, much more varied and beautiful Italian one but what you see here is how the height representing anti-pro-EU position, so the higher the height, the more EU support at that intersection of particular values of left-right and conservative progressive dimensions. So just to give you a, a bit of a hint what this all means, for example, as we move from right to left in the Netherlands for conservative people, then we see that on average EU support increases. And this is the same as we move from conservative towards the progressive end of the scale, both for left-wing people and for right-wing people. And then if you see where the peak of EU support is in the Netherlands, is for people who are very progressive, not a surprise of course, but then people that are not entirely at the left end of the left-right scale, but very close to the left extreme. And then in Italy, the landscape is rather different. So here we can discover the, the U-curve in three dimensions, and we can see the U-curve on the left-right for conservatives, we can see that for progressives, and we can even see that when we switch to the other dimension, but it's not so clear. So. Um, the Italian landscape is much closer to the idea of the U-curve as translated into three dimensions, the Dutch one, not really. The next slide shows the same for Germany and for France. And uh, I was just gonna say here that the German one is very much like the Dutch one. So there is very close correspondence in the structure between the German and the Dutch one. And the French one is very much like the Italian one. So here you can see the U curve, like you can see the slopes that uh, have the highest values in the middle on both the conservative and left-right dimensions. Now, there is a lot more to explore in that, but we can continue. And the next slide shows you something different. So we move here from three to four dimensions. And why we need that is because nothing from the previous landscape showed you where the voters actually are. So they showed how the positions on these three scales interact, but they don't show where the voters are. So this next set of slides actually shows where the voters are positions. On the top row, the voters, the density is indicated by color. So the more we move towards red, the more people are at that particular intersection of 
left right conservative pro anti eu and then the bottom row of the panel shows you the same but then here the density is just the height so the higher the bars the more people there at the intersection of left right conservative progressive and so, in that case anti eu positions I, are indicated yeah, as if, colors perhaps a couple more sentences so you have about you've made about 10 12 minutes so far Okay, uh, so I'll stop here. There's a lot more in the paper. The last slide, if we can scroll back to, the, uh, to that, uh, offer some conclusions. And for me, in terms of European integration, these are, first of all, that European integration positions relate in a very complex way to left, right, and conservative progressive. So we cannot assume that uh, it's a U-curve or something uh, simple as that. They're completely structured and this just calls for a very different type of analysis when we, when we look at voter positions versus part positions. So I'll stop here to leave time for comments and I'm looking forward to your reactions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna time myself as well because I know um, there's a lot of people who wanna come in here. So I've given myself about, um, time for two comments per paper and I'll actually go the reverse way, except that originally I was going to be beginning with uh, the EUI paper, if I so do it. So let me just start there, the EUI paper, which is a measurement paper, something really I, close to my heart, as, as you probably all know. Um, it's really neat, clean, uh, well-written, polished, um, ready to go out there, I think, uh, and to be uh, submitted. And I find it very interesting because I usually think of the VA as, as an instrument for mapping voter issue space. And you show here that it has a secondary use as, as a means for estimating party positioning. And that's very welcome. And it's also extremely gratifying to see um, how closely uh, convergent the estimates are with uh, both chess, particularly chess, but also with CMP. I think that's very useful for the field at large because we, we never have enough measures and, and it's, it's nice uh, to see that these converge, particularly if they tap into different sources of, of information. Um, my first comment relates to production transparency and Frederico, you, you talked a bit about the process and you also do that in the paper. And just my, my it's really a question I'm playing with. Um, how could one make uh, production transparency or the production of party estimates of, of an instrument like the VEAA more transparent, uh, right? And so it seems to me that the main difference with chess, because it's a, some sort of expert survey, expert survey plus, I could say, the main difference is, uh, A, as, as you mentioned, you incorporate additional information there um, from party headquarters in addition to what's in the expert's head but the chief one is really the, the information process right because what uh, VA does it it pulls that information into a deliberative coding exercise what chess does it treats the expert assessments as independent information bits and that has certain implications for um for you know reliability and validity. So chief advantage of chess is that you, one can assess reliability um, most directly by estimating the standard uh, deviations among the experts. Um, but you know not quite sure about the about the validity because you never quite know uh, where the whether the, uh, where there might be systematic error. And a chief advantage of the VEA approach is, is the focus on on validity, right? And and as you may know from my some of you may know from my other work, like on regional authority index or the uh, measurement of international of international authority. I'm, I'm a fan of iterative team coding. I think the idea of pooling information uh, to estimate complex um, complex positions uh, is is valuable. Um, in our case, we could make that process transparent because we could make a point of of relating every coding decision to um, something hard in law, uh, in constitutions, and we could also, we, we could then document that process as well. And I'm wondering how I might go about doing this in future, for example, or whether you've done this already um, with respect to VEA, whether there's something that one can do in terms of more systematically 
uh, documenting item wording, how that changes, um, how estimates uh, change as a result of consecutive inputs in this iterative process. So that's my biggest comment really. And the second one is, is just picking up on something you also mentioned in your presentation. It's interesting that the estimates are slightly more divergent between uh, both CHESS and, and the CMP on the one hand and um, VA on the other, on the economic left, right. And um, I wonder whether what, what might be behind this, whether this is a methodological artifact, the fact that you only have two items that carry across the three, one could check that, right? Because you could, you could estimate this for one of the waves and, and where you have more items or whether it's perhaps uh, something about the particular item wording. Sometimes I, I, you know, I had a sense looking at the items that the, the, the scale might be truncated. You don't quite capture the whole left, right dimension there. Again, for some of your other items that don't carry over the three waves, you probably could test that. Or whether it's a reflection of the nature of the issue space connecting to some of the other papers um, we've, we've uh, seen today, that is that perhaps there's something less crystallized about the economic left-right issue space in contemporary Europe. So just a really, really great paper. Briefly on Dimitar and Andre's paper, um, different, different data source, but different uh, similar data generation process, right? Um, and, and this is really, um, and Dimitar, I had to cut you off, but you have just these wonderful um, visualizations uh, so this is a way of how you can visualize uh, issue space um, in citizens' head, and I, I very much like it. I also very much like your, your starting point, that is that attitudes towards European integration should be conceived as a plane in a multidimensional space, but not necessarily a flat plane. You know, there's, you know, just you conceived as, as a, a plane with valleys and and, and hills and, uh, and the game is an understanding, not only mapping, but then understanding the shape of these valleys and hills and, and your techniques bring this out. Um, I think you know, and this is my first um, and major comment. Um, I, I think you know what the challenge is if you uh, plan to, um, to uh, publish this, that is right now this, this, this is not a paper, there is so much going on and um, it's very difficult to see the forest for the trees. And I think one thing is that you will need to decide what the primary purpose of this paper is. Is it, is it methodological or is it substantive, right? If it's methodological, you, you, you really want to show the various ways in which you can visualize this plane. If it's substantive, I think you, can't, you have to come in with, a, with just a, a tighter, with a tighter view. Uh, I think that's, I'll leave that up to you, but it, I think this is obviously an issue with respect to publication. Um, second uh, point is, and maybe that is for the next paper, and once you go in terms of, I, I think you could focus more on, on the type of structure rather than the lack of structure. I think you overplay, you say several times, lack of structure here and there. I think what is interesting and that came out much more in your presentation is the various shapes that the structure can take. And so ideally, I'd love you to conceptualize this up front and then, and then use this as, as benchmarks to evaluate the empirical valley, uh, valleys and hills that you find in, in, in your countries. Uh, let me just move on to Nicolas' paper, uh, which asks to what extent we see ideological structure or consistency among party cons constituencies and, and this is using the CCP data set, uh, the same data set that is being used uh, by Davide and Lorenzo in the, in the final paper. This is a really, um, really very carefully, uh, very mature uh, and polished paper that uh, systematically sets out um, clear expectations and then uses a variety of methods of looking at the data, of cutting the data to, to um, evaluate the, the veracity of these hypotheses. I've got two uh, quick points on this. Um, one is, again, I know there is a version out there, uh, I think, um, for review. Um, I found there was a lot going on, particularly in the early part where you have your seven figures. Um, and, 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 you know, this is a, a part of the paper that actually occupies about 13 pages. The figures are, are very difficult to 
it's very difficult to see the forest for the trees, even though at the end then you, you summarize, you succinctly summarize it. So one way, um, one way would to be would be to actually dismiss with with the figures and find a different way of 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 coming to the, your bottom line, which is essentially that you have a limited structure on on the Galtan, I'll call it, and the and the left right, but si significant though variable structure on on the demarcation uh, dimension or the transnational cleavage dimension. Um, I know you care a lot about the generational perspective. I actually think that you don't find a lot. I mean, you set up the paper as if it's mostly, mostly going to be about the generational perspective. That is that you're gonna see these evolving patterns much more sharply among the younger people than the older people. By the way, I wouldn't say young and adults because I think in your younger, um, there's, there's up to 35. I'm not, in my book, these are adults as well, but younger and, and I don't know more older people, I suppose. Um, the thing is, um, there isn't an awful lot of difference. Um, you may, there are some fine points, some subtle differences. This is really up to you whether this is sufficient uh, to, to warrant the added complication that, it's, uh, that it brings to the paper, or whether you just want to simplify it and simply look at, look at the citizen space um, in general. My second comment is more theoretical, and I need to speed up here a bit. And this is, I think, what I thought was really, really interesting. You write on page 29, overall, it's worth stressing that saliency of issue goals is more relevant than mean positions in differentiating party constituencies. That is, it's more a matter of that these party, parties talk about different issues, care about different issues, than that they are necessarily positioned on different issues. Now, at one level, this is not new. We've always had a debate about the relative um, veracity of, of positioning versus salience and so forth. But what's so really special about your data and also the way you present it is that you can bring these two together. And I think, uh, you know, I'd love you to, to make more of this, either in this paper, in a revised, revised version, or in, in a, a subsequent paper. And then finally, the paper by Davide and, and Leonardo, which uh, of the four papers takes their sharpest, clearest angle. Um, if I can summarize it somewhat um, crudely, perhaps, it's the economy stupid, right? Um, economic issues as key drivers of electoral change alongside issue, uh, cultural issues and perhaps equally important as cultural issues. I think this is really a fun paper to read. It's contrarian, it's punchy, it's empirically very well informed. And I think it has a very strong uh, research design. I, I think that's a really a strong feature of it. The two-step structure, two-step structure rather, passing out first the direct effects of, of economic uh, issues alongside cultural effects. And then next, the conditional effects. Um, of cultural of of economics uh, um, uh, on cultural issues, uh, both at the individual and and at that's my own reminder that I've actually hit the ten minutes. So let me just briefly give my two um, hit my two points here. I think my chief comment is that your paper tries too hard to be correct, to be right, and to disprove the so-called other side. And at sometimes it sets up a bit of a straw man. Let me just read one sentence, we might greatly misunderstand the success of cultural demarcation parties by claiming that it reveals only cultural discontent. Now I'm wondering who among the so-called demarcationist theorists would say only cultural discontent, right? Um, I, I see Hans Peter is still in the audience there, he can speak for himself. Uh, Peter Hall, um, Gary and I, I don't think we would say that. We would, I mean, we just make a point of rooting it in, in in economic and uh, basis, education, rural, urban status change, they have a hard uh, economic core. So I think you will not find many markation, demarcation integration scholars who disagree that economics matters. Um, I think there might be a debate about um, what kind of economics. Um, I think many of us would emphasize rather change in economic circumstances. Uh, greater economic uncertainty, for example, or economic dislocation as a result of globalization, rather than a state of deprivation. What you have in your models is a state of deprivation, poverty versus wealth, for example, versus pro prosperity, both at the individual 
and the regional level. So I think we can have a debate about that. And we can also have a debate about where you would locate economic effects in the causal chain. You know, how proximate or how distal it is to uh, the dependent variable, in your case, a vote swift, uh, shifting, right? And my second comment is really very brief, and that's my very last thing to say, is to what extent your argument, your beef with uh, cultural demarcationists is driven by a single country, by France which is uh, your data show, but also data in, in several of the other papers, which show is very often a bit of an outlier in the sense that economic issues, at least if to the extent that you, um, that, that one estimates the effect of issues on, on party positioning or on, on um, citizen positioning, um, still have a lot of bite, but how far beyond Fran France does that travel? In all, uh, four really, really excellent papers. And, and in the interest of um, releasing the audience, I suggest we open it up to uh, some questions first and then uh, come back to you to its DM, maybe take two or three questions, seeing how many we have. I see some in the chat. Chat is easier for me than the blue hand for the simple reason that I then have a clearer idea of the order. Um, so I have my chat open now. Um, let me see. I think Simon. I'm sure there's loads of other questions. Thanks. Is it? Wow, really cool papers. Um, I just had a question to Federica, which is, you've got three time periods, but you don't investigate, you investigate change in the correlations across the three over time, but you don't investigate change within each of them over time, right? So I'd be interested to know you know, following on from the kind of thing I'm interested in here, you're assuming these are three completely orthogonal dimensions all the way along. How does that, how do they relate to it? Does the, do the, do they, how does the intercorrelation between them change over time, particularly in your uh, profile? If you haven't looked at it, don't worry. I just think that would be interesting to. to... Thank you, Simon. This is love. Um... Ralas, and sorry, I've probably butchered your name. No, it's it's quite all right. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering why why include CMP and at Europe manifestors? It would seem to be a more obvious choice to 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 assess VEA with Euro manifestors and not CMP data. I see. For now, no other questions. We have time till 10.30, but um, I would then suggest that we briefly go back to, to the four um, teams and maybe um, limit your responses to one of you in each team. And let me just start perhaps with uh, Frederico's team, because I think you got the most questions here, Frederico or someone else from that team. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Maximum two minutes. Okay, possible. no, I'll, I'll be short. <laughs> I'll basically <laughs> take on board all your comments. They are extremely helpful. Thank you very much for Elizabeth for carefully reading our paper. Um, you have raised two two important points. We could definitely do more about transparency. We we have done so in other in other publications with the VA. So we have additional data that we could put into this paper. Um, yeah, so we, we can we can do something about that. And uh, on the left right dimension, yes, it's actually a good idea to look at, well, if we don't have the continuous statements, look at a, a single time point. And it's definitely something we should consider uh, in before deciding uh, about the future steps. Uh, regarding Simon's point um, on the changes within dimensions across time, if I understood correctly. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the question. Um, initially, we had a section looking at um, so how, how the estimations from the, the VAA changed across time in the different dimensions. And we, well, we, it, it was not the core focus of the- not, not within dimension, how the dimensions relate to each other. So, you know, does party position mm. on, on Galtan correlate with party position on left, right, correlate with party position on pro and anti-Europe? And how does that relationship change over time? Are we heading more towards a one-dimensional space or not, is I guess the question. Yes, it's not something we, we had thought of, but it's definitely uh, a good idea 
yeah, we I, it, we I think we'll have to think about that. And I, but it's definitely uh, uh, something worth exploring. Thank you very much. And why did we use your, uh, the CMP instead of Euro manifestos? Uh, we it's definitely another source we could use uh, in addition to CMP or instead of CMP. Uh, there was no particular reason to choose the CMP over the Euro manifestos. The VA focus on EP elections. Chapel Hill, not no, uh, not necessarily. Um, but uh, yes, we could look at your manifestos as well. It's 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 uh, also a good idea. Well, thank you very much. I'll leave the floor to the others. Uh, we're short on time. Thank you so much, Frederico. Um, Dimitir, do you want to? Um, oh. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your comment. I, I completely agree that uh, this is not a paper yet, but uh, more of a report, and perhaps there are several several possible papers in it. Part of the difficulty of focusing that in, in into a single coherent argument is that it so much depends whether one looks at these uh, self placements objective positions or inductively derived positions, because there are essentially three different stories to be told, depending on whether one looks into self-placement, objective, and inductively derived positions. And I'm still not sure which are the relevant ones. I think all of them somehow, but then they tell so many, so much different stories that it's hard to put together into a common narrative. Just mm -hmm. one example, I mean, the peak of EU support when you look at self-placement is for moderately left people. If you look at their objective positions on issues we think relate to left-right, it's in the very corner of the spaces for people who have extreme left positions. So which, which of the two is the truth? Um, when we make up our mind about that, then I think we're gonna go back to the data and focus it on a, on a more coherent narrative. But uh, thank you very much for, for your comments. Nicola? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your comments uh, that are very appreciated and uh, for your suggestions. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, case of a revised version. Yes, I agree. Maybe seven figures are too much, but as you know, I've put a lot in, in the appendix already. So, <laughs> so I wanted to left something in, within the paper, but uh, I'm going to think is, about... For those who haven't seen the paper, the, actually, Nicola sent around more than 100 pages. So there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Also a very rich appendix. <laughs> yeah, for that reason. But I'm going to think about a different, uh, maybe, visualization of the, uh, instead of the figures. And yes, I agree. Uh, there are not so huge differences between uh, young people and older people. And uh, albeit still, there are some differences. And, uh, and I totally agree with you that the, the, the importance to combine uh, saliency with the position of uh, issues, on issues. So good. And uh, of course, in case you have uh, uh, practical suggestions, these are going to be very welcome. And uh, you can write me. It, it would be great. I will send, I will send uh, extra comments uh, your way. Um, Davide and, and Lorenzo. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Lisbeth, for, for, for these uh, so interesting comments. Now, uh, I agree on the um, compliment that it's a punchy paper and then on uh, observing that it's too punchy. And it definitely is. Uh, I have to say this is the first draft. So our aim was first to get the argument right and clear for us first. And then it's going to be nuances about that. So the fact that we are already aware of some literature that is trying to find these economic nuances. One key point, state versus change. This is our original conceptual aim. Our best indicator would be, for example, job mortality or mm -hmm. job mortality or job transfers in specific areas. We hadn't found the data yet. So we started with GDP, which is a state and it's very rough measure, but the aim is to have better measures to get a more precise operationalization of, of what we have in our mind. And um, in terms of its location in the causal process, that's something we have to spell out more clearly in our explanatory mechanism. But I mean, the aim of the paper, it, indeed, the argument is punchy because our hunch, our intuition is that these economic factors might have mattered more than is 
has been documented so far in the literature. Second point, uh, France or other specific countries. Uh, are they, is France alone driving the results? Now, uh, I wouldn't say so much. That is to say, we, we provided a very summary presentation, but in fact, we see that economic issues are relevant even in other countries and perhaps not the drivers. But also let's remind one thing, these are the key issue drivers of all vote change, all vote shifts across all parties. So it's basically the issues that decided the election. Of course, there is still room for heterogeneity, causal heterogeneity. So it might be that specific parties benefited from more specific issues, and this might reinforce the conclusions in the future. And also, I have to say that the interactions are mostly, uh, I don't go into many technical details, but there are more in the paper. The interactions are mostly going in most cases uh, uh, to reinforce the, the hypothesis. So uh, even more than we uh, claimed in the presentation. But uh, finally, what I expect is that if we are able to find more appropriate indicators, I expect findings to, to come out even more clearly. This is really just the first draft. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. And I, um, I see Alex uh, on, on the list here. Alex Drexler. Drexler. Yes, thank you, uh, Lisbeth. Just a very uh, quick note on the Euro Manifesto question by Vyacheslav. I uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think for 2019 there has been any Euro Manifesto data released, right? I think the series stops in 2014. The European election studied, I, but not 100 percent sure, did not include that, or has at least not published it so far. Daniela, just feel free to come in. On this. Yeah, I have, I have a quick comment on the Euro Manifesto data because uh, I'm the responsible person for that. Um, yeah, you, yes, you're right. Um, the data is not yet available because we had some problems with funding. But finally, I'm very happy to announce that uh, it will be available soon. We start the project in March, so next week, and then I hope that the data will be available at yeah at the latest next year or so. So it it did not really stop. We had just some problems with funding. Good news, thank you. Um, uh, Gary? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a, a comment on um, Lorenzo um, et al. I've forgotten the authors there. Um, and well, actually two comments. One, um, yeah, I like the idea of looking at the interaction of cultural and economic factors because we do realize that they are intimately uh, related. Not only that, but cultural um, attitudes tend to be relatively stable and economic circumstances can change more precipitously. So, you know, the, depending on one's perspective, you're really going to find whether one or the other is going to be most causally uh, influential. But there's a general point behind this. And that is when you look at um, cleavages that are perceived to be chiefly economic, take the Industrial Revolution. And when you look closely at the attitudes that lay behind the class cleavage, you see that culture, norms, community. I mean, I've done work on coal miners in the uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. You know, these were culturally uh, solidaristic uh, groups. Um, if they weren't, it, the, the class cleavage was not simply economic. Um, and so, even historically, when you look at the process of cleavage uh, generation. Um, you're looking at the interaction of uh, cultural and, and economic uh, factors. So, um, you know, the, the challenge really is not about the relative weighting. It really is a challenge about how are we going to fit these together, under what circumstances, or what are the conditions under which they uh, interact and how. Uh, Lisbeth, can, can I quickly reply? Absolutely, to that? yes. Yeah, uh, it's a good point. However, I mean, there. I think these are two different distinctions because, of course, when you think about cleavages, you have the interaction between the uh, structural factor, the conflict. Then you have the symbolic component, which I assume is what you're referring to, and of course, you have organization. Now, 
And what we are clear, clearly sure about is that the symbolic component of the class cleavage has evaporated. No party almost uh, nowadays tries to mobilize voters based on their economic conditions sharply compared to cultural conditions. But a different thing is to separate this symbolic component of a cleavage from a different distinction that is the one between economic issues and cultural issues. That is to say, uh, for example, given attitudes against, uh, there is something that is frequent in the literature, which is to totally overlap and equate European integration with economic globalization. Now, we know that the processes are two very different things. And there was some time in the very beginning of the European project where the European market was also thought as a sort of a shield towards unregulated global markets. And the EU integration was not originally thought as a project for um, or as a neoliberal project. So it might well be that you have a separation between cultural and economic attitudes towards these processes. What we argue in the paper is that the first politicization of globalization was made on the left against economic globalization. So there is a clear separation on attitudes on the economic dimension of globalization versus the cultural dimension. But this is the old contradiction of the left, the internationalism on the left versus the desire for national protection of country specific class cleavage agreements. So. What we're arguing here is that, yes, a symbolic component of the cleavage to us is a different thing from a cultural issue. What we are looking for, and it's very hard to find it, it's not going to be easy, is whether in this hostility towards more integration, towards more cultural integration, what instead lies behind is some problem of feeling lost due to economic change and economic integration and economic globalization because of objective material conditions. And in this case, I will see that is a more economic motivation rather than a broader hostility to, in cultural terms. And the, the example here would be, again, the first politicization, the no global movement, which was clearly against economic globalization. But these people were very cosmopolitan and very open. So you've got to start to think about what what an economic um, factor is. I mean, whether status in, is involved. You know, when you say economic, well, for example, you can deal whether, with the loss of a job or the yeah. loss of income. I mean, uh, just um, but actually, think, when you is, really probe <laughs> what is involved there, you know, you can actually find that uh, there are going to be cultural factors there. You know, we really need, I think we really, you know, one of the implications of actually this discussion is that we really have to probe this distinction, which is taken often far too literally or, or simply uh, between economics and, uh, and culture. Well, for and example, you take, for example, Peter Hall's more recent work, economic um, uh, effects are often analyzed from the, sta yeah. from the standpoint of status. So I think this is a very interesting area for-, for When you came in. Yes. It Sorry, sounded like Rose. Someone's uh, microphone was accidentally on. I think this, this is all it was. Um, I, I'm going to just cut in this a very interesting discussion because I see Nicola. Nicola wants to come in here. So why why don't you why don't you, why don't you Nicola? Uh, just um, a curiosity for Lorenzo and Davide. Uh, in, in your model, which is the role of education? Because maybe there could be also an educate sort of a educational trap uh, that could explain also economic distress. Thanks. May I? Yes, yes, Lorenzo, please. Uh, Nicola, education is added as a simultaneous interaction with all issue predictors alongside um, uh, economic condition. So the aim is to try to separate the effects, the interaction effect of economic marginality and from the effect of cultural marginality. Just uh, 10 seconds on Gary's point about what is economic, what is cultural. One of the main episodes of the French campaign was Marine Le Pen unexpectedly showing at the Whirlpool factory who was decided to be moved 
to Poland. That's very simple. It's about job losses. And when people realize they lose their job because of the single market or because as frequently in manufacturing countries like Italy, it gets moved to uh, Vietnam or other countries because of economic globalization, they might be very cosmopolitan and very open, but they don't like this aspect of economic transformation. That, that's the humbly the example we had in mind when we were thinking about this potential impact. Okay, very, very good. This, it's, um, this actually has proven that Zoom conferences can be animated um, and you can have genuine um, to and fro discussion. Um, as you know, in a civilized way. Thank you all. I think this was a truly, um, truly exceptionally interesting uh, first panel, I thought. Great papers, uh, food for thought. Um, there's a lot more in the papers. I can only recommend people to, to, um, to go in and read them uh, closely. And I think uh, we're now going to take a break. I, I had a lapse and said we can go on till 10.30. Of course, I meant to say 4.30 your time. It shows where I am, so which we are now. So we're going to take a break for about half an hour and then return for panel number two.